I think I'll just go. Um, I know, sorry we're running a little bit late, guys. That's my fault. I just landed and um, had some issues. But um, thanks for being patient and for turning up. And uh, we've got a very, very, very interesting, very deep discussion with some amazing people. So what I'm going to do is um, this panel is all about music cities and break, breaking the idea of a music city down to see what it means for uh, the greater benefits on its population. So what I'm going to do first quickly is just kind of give my thoughts on what a music city is and then I want to bring in the panel to discuss a little bit around what music cities mean to them in their respective cities. Um, and I also want to precursor this by saying that it doesn't have to be a city, it could be anywhere. It could be a place, a, a neighbourhood, a district, a country. Um, but I think we're all musicians, we're all involved in music, right? We're all kind of in tune with uh, the cultural happenings. So I think we're all on, on side to say that music does make everything better anyway in terms of it, how it interacts with our lives. But um, music cities from, from the work that we've been doing at Sound Diplomacy is all about identifying the ecosystem of how music involves itself within the broader city um, scape. So it's all about music's role with everything and how it affects us from nursery to nursing home. It's not necessarily about the idea of uh, a music industry or live music, that's all part of it, but it's, a part, it's about the broader effect of music on our well-being, on our education. Um, music has been proven to help cognitive learning, it's been proven to um, prevent the onset of, of things, you know, um, memory loss, things like that. So, you know, it has p positives in, in every walk of life. Um, but I think what we want to get into today is, is kind of how we break it down and how we can kind of manage those benefits a little bit better within the city so that we can think about how the future may look within our cities to make them better and work better for our um, people. So, I'm from Committee Called Sound Diplomacy, my name's Danny. Any questions, please put your hands up and we will address them as we can within the, within the uh, discussion. Um, so. Oh yeah, can you all understand me? There is um, translation devices, I believe. I just assumed. <laughs> How ignorant of me, my, my English way. Um, so, without further ado, I would like to kind of let the panel introduce themselves, who they are, and give a little one-liner about what a music city means to them in their respective places. So, I'm going to start with Martin, to my left. Hello, Martin. Hello, hello Danny. Hello, hello Milan. Um, so, I won't go through all the things that I do, because there's too many of them. Although, I have got one new project. I'm going to do a festival in the demilitarized zone in um, Korea, which is my, as of three days ago, I got permission to go ahead and do that. Um, I'm involved with the Music Cities Convention with Shane, Danny's co colleague. We just did one in Memphis. Um, I'm also, so day after tomorrow, I go up to somewhere to the north of Birmingham in England because I'm, we are working with a, with a property investment company um, planning to build a complex with like a load of rehearsal spaces, recording studios, bars, food, whatever, which is, this is quite a new thing in the music city's world. So I know that there's, you know, there's one in Tallinn in Estonia, there's one in Chicago that's got 90 rehearsal spaces that's sold out at Human Advance. So as you say, it, it's, the whole music is, is quite a sort of general subject. For me, that whole thing about taking over an old fa an empty factory and building a music-based thing, not exclusively music, and then crucially, obviously, keeping that cheap, because southern England is um, really expensive for artists and crew to live in. So we just want to encourage a migration north. And um, that'll do for, yes, that'll do for the... My opening remarks. Thank you, Martin. Filippo. Oh, sorry, Z. Good morning. I'm Filippo Del Corno, the Deputy Mayor for Culture of Milan. I'm a musician because I am a composer. My profession is to write music, but now I am, have to stop my work 
to, to serve as Deputy Mayor for Culture. I started in 2013, and I'm now in my second term, so I will end in 2021. Uh, I'm very happy to be here because uh, we started this important idea of creating a Milano Music Week. It's a new project. This is the first edition. We are cooperating and collaborating with uh, Lion Check to realize this project. And uh, now we are in the third day of our first Music Week, so we are a little in a trouble because we are trying to understand how the project is going on. Uh, for us, doing this Milano uh, Music Week is the first step, it's something like a starting point about uh, a work, uh, uh, about the work of creating Milano as a music city. Thank you very much. Bruno, would you like to introduce yourself and say a few words? Yes. Hello, my name is Bruno Blancard. So um, I'm French. <laughs> I'm living in Paris. And I have a place in Paris which is called the Grand Rex with a club which is quite a famous one. I think you know it. It's the Rex Club where um, all the electronic, mostly the electronic music in France was born a long time ago. And uh, I'm a partner, I'm, a, I'm in the board of the tourism uh, of Paris. I'm an administrator of the tourism in Paris. And uh, what else? I do a lot of things, but I've been working with the city of Paris since the last 10 years. And um, I think that uh, I would like to thank you for welcoming me here. I want to give you probably a short testimony of what we have done in Paris and what we would like to do in the future. Uh, I would like to say that it's that kind of uh, meetings, of conference, of uh, way to, to cross over everybody is very, very important because it's a place where we share different ideas. It's a place where you can share experience and it's a place where you show to the cities and to all the people concerned, how important the music is for the cities concerned. Thank you. Timo. Hi, my name is Timo. I'm uh, supposed to say thank you. Thank you uh, for inviting us and uh, thanks for the panel. Um, I'm from Hamburg, city of Hamburg. I work for the Hamburg Music Business Association, which is the network and lobbying body for the music uh, industry, music companies in Hamburg and around. Um, it's also, apart from being the network, we're, we're running a lot of the projects that the city is uh, funding us for, like um, internationalization projects, education projects, uh, an award show, which we just did yesterday, so please excuse if I'm yawning uh, from time to time. And uh, this, apart from that, I'm running a club and a small music club in Hamburg as well, and we're also promoting a couple of festivals. Oh, and city of Hamburg as a music city, you want to... You wanna I mean, you may be able to say a few words. Is it? I don't know. Is it? Is it a music city? I don't know. It's... Um, it's up to everyone to say if it's a music city. What, what is a music city? I mean, a music city can be small. It can be a city like Salzburg, uh, or it can be New York City. So, uh, well, it's a it's a city, I believe, that recognizes its music's role, which I believe Hamburg does, and also reaps some economic benefits from that, which is what we want to discuss and what we want to figure out. Um, so, thank you for all introducing yourselves and, and thank you all for being patient with us. Um, so, I want to get into, like, what are the benefits of a city being a music city? Because there are several um, channels of, of, um, of positives and let's get away from the intangible stuff. Let's think about what music can bring to a city. Um, I'm, would, Filippo, can I hand this to you to, to start what, from your experience, what you think the municipality is, has, um, has gained from music initiatives? I would say that music, I think it's a, it's a um, crucial driver of uh, city development for many reasons. Of course, one of the most important is an economic reason, and we can say and talk about the reputation of the city growing as the music city is recognized. Uh, the city branding, of course, promoting your city as a music city helps you in attract tourism, and not, and not only tourism. Uh, the attracting is also it's very important about uh, other economic fields of investment in your city. But I think 
the most important thing about being a music city is in terms of social inclusion. Uh, music is the most important driver of relation between people and uh, music is a language who can talk to everybody and music is a language that can join together different people coming from different cultures and different generations, different ages and so on. And music is the most important instrument we have of social inclusion, especially because if we, uh, if, if we let the music to be the protagonist of the city, you create safer condition of life also. Absolutely. And so I think it's very important to think when you are talking about being a music city, uh, working not only on the stage, on the, on the field of the economic uh, development of the music industry, but also in terms of the importance of the social inclusion you are doing through music and thanks to the music. And I would say also, just to add a little thing, that the input to make uh, Milan, Milan as a music city was very highly supported by several representative bodies. Especially, I would like to mention the CI, the Italian Copyright Collecting Society, and the FIMI, that it is the Italian Recording Industry Association. And they worked a lot uh, helping us in creating the project of the Milano Music Week as a starting point for establishing Milan as a music city. And, and this work on economic level, especially about the, 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 the industry of music as a very important point of development of the city. The muni municipality must work on the level of social inclusion, I think. And what is our duty now is to have, as much as we can, the music as real, the main, uh, the main character of the narration we are doing of our city, involving all the people uh, we can. Absolutely. Um, That's good. Uh, may I say something? Of course, yeah, of course. It's very good that you, I hear you and you're talking about music in a positive point, which is good. It took us more or less 10 years before Paris realized that music was exactly what you said and explained. It took us 10 years to show to the city of Paris that music is something very important for tourism. Music is very important for background cultural, with our DJs, with what we call the French touch, for instance, in Paris. It took us a real long time before. We had to, we had to 10 years ago, to launch a petition, you know, in Paris. We said, Paris is dying. We said, Paris has a bonnet de nuit, that is to say something on your head, that you came during while you're sleeping, okay? And suddenly, all the press around the world, and mostly the, the UK one, took back, <laughs> she's laughing, because we have been laughing, about that, took our petition and said, Paris is no more a music place. Paris is dying. Then the mayor of Paris said to us, what is happening? What do you, why do you say that Paris is missing everything related to the music? And we said to the mayor, you have to do something. You have to promote the music. You have to stop in terms of tourism or background cultural, to talk about the Eiffel Tower or, you know, all this place, the Champs-Élysées. You have to talk about what's happening in, in Paris and what is happening and what is very positive and very useful for the city in terms of economics, in terms of tourism, is what is happening around music, in the clubs, everywhere in the, in the festival. So you have to help us. And it took us 10 years before changing the way of dealing with that kind of things. Well, it often does take a crisis. It's similar to the story in, in London. But uh, before we go into that, I want you to kind of delve into this new project of yours, Martin, and think about how that is going to benefit using music as the tool to develop a new or sorry an old <coughs> existing place what are you hoping to achieve through that yeah i was going to talk briefly about adelaide before that but oh, i'm happy okay. to, only because a lot of the recent stuff on music cities and i regret coming up with that name um has come from the work that i spent a now. year about four years ago working for the south australian government to come up with a music strategy and Adelaide is about 1.3 million people, but it's way smaller than Sydney, Melbourne, well, for that matter, Brisbane, whatever. So they had a real problem with all their young people, talented young people leaving Adelaide to go in particular to Sydney, Melbourne, London, Los Angeles. And part of that problem was because there, there was a very unhealthy music scene there. So the people who were involved with music all, all seemed to hate each other. 
and um, it was just bad. So, I mean, I, I can't go into the whole thing, but it, but it ended up that they've now they converted a church and they've got a venue there, you know, they've got training facilities, and pretty much everyone involved with Adelaide music scene is now working out of that place. The Premier regularly visits it, and they started seeing some real success stories of Adelaide bands actually becoming big, which is like, for years, there was no one big from Adelaide. Absolutely. Um, so in terms of the, um, the project, that, um, the, the North of Birmingham project, um, I mean, what, one of the things that's positive about this is I think that Every, oh sorry, I'll go back one step. It's really every significant city or region should have some sort of policy on music. And we always say you start off with doing the research. So how many people actually are involved with music in your, in your city or your region? You know, what are the gaps in, you know, those sort of, you know, the SWOT now, the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats, you know. What, what, what do you mean? He's like, are, are bands actually touring in your, you know, your thing? Because that, that, that's a really important part. It's, not, you know, it's, it's, it's a small part of the picture, but it's an important part. Absolutely. So, say, in, in, in southern England, we have this huge problem with it's just got getting so expensive for artists, crew, managers, whatever, to live in London and most, most of the south, south, southeast. Um, yet we have, we have some great northern cities that have a lot of empty land in them. Um, that really could do with regeneration. And music is one of the cheapest ways to regenerate a city. Because, you know, you can build an opera house, but that costs whatever. Um, where it's actually making it easier for, you know, young rock bands, dance acts, whatever, to do their craft um, is a really cost-effective way of doing it. And what's interesting now is that private capital is getting involved all over the world. Yeah. So they've actually started to recognise it. Because if you move a bunch of, whether it's musicians, visual artists, just creative people into a run-down area, that area is going to be gentrified. So as so long as you can keep the core space mm -hmm. free, cheap for artists, you know that... So we're, we're aiming to move about 1,000 creative people to, to the, the place we're looking at. And obviously the council loves it, because most councils in the world these days have are, are not very wealthy, mm -hmm. certainly not in the UK, certainly not with Brexit. Um, so, know you know, so that's what we see is long term, is like we're going to create this facility and then eventually the property guy is going to build all these flats around it. But we'll keep the core facility yeah. cheap and artist friendly and we'll do things like we're going to build, a, sorry, I'm going on too long now. Um, you know, we're very close to university, big university. We're going to build student housing, but in the summer, we're not going to charge the students. We're going to we're going to rent that out really cheap piece of bands from from particularly from Canada, Australia, America, and everything. Nice. So they can come and they basically base themselves there for the whole European festival circuit. So just Great. create a community, give them a hostel with a laundrette. Yeah. They if you ever tour and there's bands, washing your clothes is a really um, painful thing. Okay. Cool. We we can do that in, in a in a in a second. Can I just say something quickly? Um, I, I think, so, so what that's basically proving is that by developing and making these initiatives, whether it's Adelaide or north of Birmingham, not only are you attracting young creative minds and thus activating areas which need re regeneration, you're also creating more employment, more jobs within the community, you're bringing in the revenue for, with, for the community, making it inclusive, working with music and Absolutely. So working, working with this kind of very kind of um, proactive, long-sighted strategy on how music can then really activate an area through what we've learned in the past and what has created the crises in our cities with our cultural spaces and music venues closing down because of the archaic infrastructure around them. Music is the cheapest tool to make these places run properly. But also, it isn't just about bringing them and giving them the support. It's, it's looking further in, deeper into the picture of what does it mean for the local housing? What does it mean for the transport networks? What does it mean for the different spaces and places? And you know, it's very important to understand the, the whole breadth of, of, the, of the discussion so that you're engaging all of the stakeholders. It's really good to hear that the collection societies in Milan are involved and, and again, you know, I think you need to have all parties around the table to have the broader proactive discussion. Um, so I think 
I mean, Timo, did you have anything to say on this? Have you got anything that you think... Oh, I, could, I could add on the point of uh, crisis as being the origin of starting something new. Uh, you might know Hamburg uh, has a history of being a music city or at least music related with, I don't know, it goes back to Brahms and Bach and Telemann and, and those classical composers and stuff. Uh, by the way, Telemann, he kind of invented selling tickets for concerts, so kind of the inventor of the whole life industry and, and that sort of stuff. So this is the, the cultural and music music heritage that some cities bring with them. And then came the Beatles and stuff and Reaper Barn and the clubs and uh, and um, from the development of, of, of music and the music city, you can sometimes see that it's not, especially in the past, it's not always policies to drive uh, creative development, for example, uh, at Reeperbahn and why the club industry in uh, St. Pauli in uh, Hamburg is working so well is due to the fact as well that uh, because of AIDS in the 80s, a lot of the brothels closed down and there was vast space for, for, for something to do and no one else wanted to get, get those places but the musicians and the, the club owners. So. It doesn't always have to do with policies. Some uh, external factors can really help bring in up music in this uh, bad case of AIDS, really. Um, but, and then again, I don't know, um, there was, but there was with, the, uh, with Eastern and Western Germany teaming up again, uh, people at some point moved to Berlin because it had more spaces, because uh, there was there was no space left in Hamburg, at least not north of the river. No one and now everyone in Berlin is south. looking for somewhere else to move, I hear, right? Because it's not been managed in the most appropriate way in the... So, sorry? Yeah, exactly. So now Leipzig is the new Berlin, I right. believe, right? So I be this, this goes to show that, you know, by by kind of providing these spaces, you're attracting these, these kind of, you know, the movers and shakers, the people that activate and, and energize a place. And so, okay, so we, we've recognized the value of music. We know that within our cities, it's great. It engages socially, engages economically, um, creates jobs, builds on tourism opportunities, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So, how do we achieve this? How do we do it? Martin's obviously working in, co in cahoots with uh, some property developers who are enabling a, a, a whole development, but that isn't always the way our cities can, can do this. So thinking about, you know, is it going to be through policy? Is it going to be through just hoping things happen? How do, we, how do these be benefits? Well, I think the first stage, you've got to get politicians to actually understand what the music ecosystem is. Because what I found in, in Adelaide in particular was that everybody asked, because I, I, I was reporting to the Premier, so the, the head of police, if I wanted to meet with the head of police, I had to meet with the head of police. And they all thought they knew what the music industry was, because everyone obviously listens to music, whatever, but actually none of them did. You know, and one of the biggest changes you made was turning it and saying, can you start looking at this as a business, not just as don't file it away under arts and pay them you know, 2% of what you pay, pay opera. So, that, that's, so that's like the, the crucial thing. And I, th and I think that's now, you know, we've seen this with the Music Cities Convention. I mean, I think there's a much, much greater understanding around the world now. And obviously, lots of reports and things like that. So people are starting to get it important. And it's different in each city. You know, that's the other thing. There is no one size. So Memphis, where we're at, obviously that required a lot, quite a lot of spending from the government to rescue Peel Street, and obviously, you know, they, the Stax Museum, well, Graceland makes enough money, but, um, you know, I mean, Memphis is now probably one of the world, world's premier music tourism destinations with a very healthy Absolutely. local industry as well. I'd, I'd like to add up to that, um, what Martin just said. Um, it's important if you obviously want the policy makers to, to, to change something, you need them to understand what it is what, that you're doing. And I think in the whole world we see in the past 20 years or somehow a change, especially with Richard Florida and creative industries, mm -hmm. it, that was the whole development of it, I think. And I wasn't quite finished earlier on when I said, what's the crisis? Uh, at some point people left to Berlin, uh, so people stuck together and so they thought, okay, we need, we need our politicians to, to know that music industry is not just musicals, and because that's what they thought up until 2000 in Hamburg. 
they said when when we when we told them uh, what well, Universal just left to Berlin, MTV, back then it was huge, um, just left to Berlin, uh, you don't do fuck all, and they, uh, they, they give MTV and Universal the best spaces at the, at the river, yeah. so uh, what, 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 are you, what are you trying to do with this? And, um, and then you need to show them the effects of it, and at first politicians seem to understand better just the economical point of view. The tourism, that was easy to understand and by now it seems like at least some of the politicians understand uh, with having read or having heard of Richard Florida and mm -hmm. uh, the, the sideway attractions that music has for other industries um, because every, every bigger company needs for their talents to come to the city, they need uh, music in their city yeah. and culture, culture in general. So yeah, it's very important to show them with the results of studies or uh, qualitative approaches how important Absolutely. it is. Absolutely. And I think as well, I mean, obviously we have a forward-thinking politician in our midst. So, you know, someone who, who is a mu musician understands the music side of it. And, and you know, I think as, as kind of Martin was saying, it's... It's absolutely initially recognizing what music is, kind of classifying it in a contemporary way and not what it used to be, like musicals, whatever. And then it's also recognizing the economy because that is obviously where we start to really talk the language of the city. So the city can then communicate its value in the language that it uses and throughout all of its departments. And you know, I think if we're talking about how we achieve the benefits, this is a great example. Right. This is, and you know, this this building is is an initiative from the municipality to support the culture sector, and I think cities need to do that more, and, and they are starting to adopt it. Um, so, you know, what what initiatives does the municipality here offer, and, and what are we seeing from that? Yes, I would like to talk about four different stage of work we have done here to foster the local music ecosystem. The first one is the, the development of new formats of events, uh, focusing especially on the very diverse music gems are now uh, working in land because, you know, we have one of the most important opera houses in the world, La Scala, and you have to, front, uh, to confront with this, of course. And so we, we create this different new um, format the first one I would like to talk about is La Prima Diffusa, which is La, La Prima is the opening evening of La Scala Theatre. It is traditionally on the December the 7th. It's a very important evening. And uh, it was always uh, perceived as an uh, exclusive event because only just the 2,000 people who can enter the Opera House can listen to the music and go to the Prima of La Scala. We decided four years ago to create another project called La Prima Diffusa, uh, moving from the exclusive evening to an inclusive evening. And so what we decided to do, we uh, asked about 14, 15 different places in the city to project uh, live the performance of La Scala giving the idea to the people going there, one is Baze, one is another place of the city, to enter in the theater. And so you have the opportunity to think that even you are not invited to go to the first uh, evening of La Scala season, but you are invited to enter the theater because you can go in a place where you can see the opera and when you can uh, share with other people the experience of listening and looking at the performance of La Scala. Uh, and we have done other festival, urban festival format. One, another very famous is a Piano City, trying to uh, transform the first idea of Piano City coming from Berlin in a very uh, diffused festival and during the days of uh, Piano City you have all the urban space of Milano completely invited uh, by pianos playing and concerts and you have concerts in uh, park, uh, public gardens, uh, uh, the trams, uh, uh, the galleries, art galleries uh, or the station so each place of the city is uh, uh, is a place where you can do a piano concert. 
And of course, another important format we are now uh, working on is Milano Music Week, and as I said, uh, this is the first edition. Another, play, another level very important of action is rediscovering the public space as place to host music events, especially the central square of Milan, Piazza Duomo. Uh, before 2013, the Piazza Duomo was not used to make concerts. And we started to make concerts of pop music, but also classical music, but also folk music in the main, plant, uh, in the main uh, square of the city. And I think it's very important because if you rediscover this attitude of the public space to be a place where music can be performed, you create real, an idea of social inclusion of the music. Because, uh, uh, you know, as a Milanese citizen, you recognize this place, at the, uh, this square, at the place where you can listen to the music. So we ask La Scala to perform a concert each year in June, open to all the city, of course, in the main square of the, of the, of the, of the city. Uh, another level, the third level is playing a role as a mediator. The municipality can be a good mediator between all the institutions and organizations representing and performing music. So we create very formal, sometimes and sometimes very informal boards to confront, to dialogue, to create projects together and to let the different, uh, the different uh, uh, institutions and associations work in the music uh, speak to each other, thanks to our administration, and uh, of course, uh, trying to create always uh, a focus, a focus project on working together. I think that is very important. Sorry to interrupt. No? The, the the communication model of a, of a board that sits partly as a, a communication tool to the state and and reverse to the industry. Um, you know, I think it's, it's an important installation to a city's makeup to have that in. We, we did the, that very thing in London and it's been very successful. Uh, the fourth level I would like to talk, it's the last, I'm sorry for, uh, I'm long, but it's a very practical, is uh, the simplification of procedures when you organize music. So we created a Sportello Unico Eventi, which is a um, centralized desk office for all the people who want to organize and realize music events. Before the Sportello Unico, if you were an uh, organizer of music in Milan, you should enter in 23 different offices, asking for 23 different permission. Wow. So we created a centralized desk office. Now we are also digitalizing it. And on Friday, we will present to the city the, the digitalization of the Sportello Unico. And now, if you, if you are organizing something, uh, live events or a concert, or other, you have the chance to go in a one desk, present your or, or the, your procedure, and then you can have the permission directly, only from one desk. It, is, it has been a really a, a revolution in our city. You know, Italy, the, the country of bureaucracy, and uh, we are the, the champion of bureaucracy. Uh, we, are not so, we are not a great football team, as you can have seen in the last... Uh, uh, in, in the last weeks, but we are really champions of bureaucracy. We are still champions of it, of course, but we tried to make bureaucracy not an enemy for music, but an ally for music, Great. a friend for music. And so this, I think, is a very important level of work for our administration in order to help the development of the idea of Milan as a music city. Absolutely. That's great to hear. Um, and so... Bruno, I've, I've, I've not spoken to you for a while, so I'm going to bring you into the conversation. Um, what, what, you know, when we talk about heritage of a city and, and, and we talk about the, the institutions and, and how they offer benefit for all of the strands of music outlet and, and branding and tourism and all this stuff, you know, how, how, is, how is kind of celebrating our heritage part of the, the broader opportunity for cities? 
Well, I feel that the best way will be uh, to use that heritage, to use that monuments and to, to just to mix the music with that kind of heritage. For instance, we had something very new uh, a month ago in Paris. Um, uh, there is a friend of us who took the La Gare Saint-Lazare, that is to say uh, the railway station, one of the most important in Paris, which is a, a very old one, very famous, very classified like a monument. No one, in, no tourist never go in the Gare Saint-Lazare are, except if you check the, the train from London, okay? But you decide to have a special event during the weekend, a 24 hours event during the weekend. And it was so successful, you know, it was crazy. At the beginning, all the police uh, in Paris said, oh my God, it's crazy. You know, we had the terror attack in Paris, you know, all the security problem we have, you cannot use a, a railway station during 24 hours. He did it. And it was so successful that it, it gives us some example of using um, all this public space which are devoted to one something specific and to use it to have a mix with the music. He had all the DJs coming. It was mostly, of course, of, uh, about electronic music, okay? But it can work, what, whatever. We have some very nice monuments in France. We have very nice old monuments, castle and whatever. And I think the heritage would be a mix of using those space, showing those space in not a specific way like the city or the nation used to do it, that is to show you with a guide explaining you the whole is story. But if you want to bring new audience to that kind of monuments, new young people, you bring them with electronic music and you have a very performant mix of things. Do, is that an answer? Yeah, no, that's great. I think basically, you know, it's, it's relating back to using the spaces in the city, yeah. activating them with music initiatives and music programs to enable the inclusivity, to enable the, the energy. And, you know, I think it's, it's important to recognize that, with, particularly with cities like Paris that haven't had the best music branding over the past 20 years or so. They faced a challenge and they've, they're coming through it. And it's, it's impressive to see. Um, just, just to tell you a short story, you know, in 2014, we had a meeting with the Ministry of Culture and with the Lord Mayor of Paris. And we said, it was 2014, and I, I started the meeting asking to the Ministry, Madame, she was, she was a lady, do you know whose band has been, has been given the Grammy Awards in the States? And suddenly, there was a silence, you know, the sound of silence. Everyone was looking, and she wasn't able to tell me. And I said, well, Daft Punk has just won four or five, four Grammy Awards. And if they were an American band, they would come back in New York in the middle of the street, we know, with a huge parade. Nothing happened in Paris. They didn't, even didn't know, you know? And of course, we have been crossing a huge, you know, the thing changed since that time. Yeah. It changed because we have been pushing, because we took the politician by the hand, like you said, it's hard. We asked them to go in our clubs, to come with us during the night, you know. We took them by the hand and we said, come with us, because the idea of what you have about music, it's an idea of the past. You know, they only knew the vinyl playing in the, in the, in the discotheque, you know, and when you kiss uh, the girl who is in front of you, they didn't know anything about about electronic music, about whatever, all the kind of music, you know, it's not specific on that field. And we took them by the hand. We spent a lot of money, you know, bringing them during the night, asking them to follow us in the club and to see what was happening and what was the French touch. That was the, the most easy way to, to talk about them. They understood. And when they understood, they changed. And when they changed, they promote the city of Paris and they promote the tourists in France in a different way. And that's something we have to share with you because because that's the best way to do it. Mm -hmm. And what I feel, and I will, I will end with that, is that, you know, we are just starting something very new on the European field. That is to say, we construct an, as an association with all club owners all over the Europe. And what I want and what we want is to go to Europe and to share in common all the problems we have, because we do have all the same problems, whatever the city is. We have the problems with alcohol, which mm -hmm. is too much. We have problems with whatever, drugs, all the negative points related to the night, but we have positive points related to the night. How do we promote on the European competition between the different cities, all that kind of music? How can we share, how can we harmonize all the legislation you were talking about, administrative, uh, uh, necessary uh, uh, topics, you know? How can we share, harmonize, do something that, you know, we have to get experience from you, you have to get experience from us, and we have to share all 
experience. Absolutely, and, um, and, and that's what the Music Cities Convention is for, right, Martin? It's, it's effectively a forum for this conversation. It's, it's global, it's, it's, um, it's engaging music industry, it's engaging cities and, and everywhere in between. Um, so, Timo. And that's also what the Music Cities Network is for. Uh, there we go. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of networks around, and uh, I think every network has to find their place. It's about information want, sharing. We're yeah. learning from each other. We yeah. are all facing the same problems. As you exactly. Stated. And um, in the Music Cities Network, for example, which is now now has seven members and seven member cities, but it's just been founded this year with uh, Sydney, Hamburg, Nantes. Uh, Berlin, Melbourne, Groningen, and Aarhus. Um, it's exactly about this sharing of knowledge because it's you don't need to reinvent the wheel the whole time. Uh, a lot of the problems you said, Italy is the capital of of bureaucracy, or what? <laughs> what was your expression? I thought that was Germany, but uh, um, so we probably can work on things together and. Uh, <laughs> How to, how to get away out of that. And there's a lot of the same things um, in all of these music cities. Space, for example, we all need to make sure there's space that rents are low for artists and for people working in the business. Uh, and that uh, high class culture, as well as low, low culture and subculture well, is included grassroots. in tourism. Grassroots is included in tourism, will get supported. And we need to find ways in, in how, we, how we support them. And uh, things are getting developed in Sydney, and we have never heard of it. And now there, there are ways of sharing that uh, knowledge Absolutely. through these conferences, music cities, conventions, or even if you don't have the money, uh, you, I don't know. Right absolutely, and, and you're are, you are absolutely right. It's learning about the initiatives that are happening in the municipality here. It's learning about the developments in, in the UK. It's learning about some of the trials and tribulations and how Paris have navigated it. And it's the same, you know, it's the same with, with Hamburg and, it, and the same with every city around the world. I think it's, it's very important to recognize that and, and kind of look at the deficiencies and how you can collaborate to build better infrastructure to support the creative communities and we touched upon the idea of grassroots the kind of subcultures the the kind of um developing creatives they are the, the probably the most important cog in the wheel because without that we wouldn't have the rest of it so now we've actually acknowledged the idea of what grassroots is and the importance of it we can start to build the support networks around them um which i guess i'm going to come back to you quickly martin um I'm conscious of time, so I don't want to drag on. I say, I think we're, around, we're officially um, running late now. I mean, this this could this topic could go on all day because it is so deep, so broad. So it's a quick kind of crash course. But you know, in terms of future proofing our cities through music developments like the one that you're involved in, you know, is is that the way forward? Is that the way cities can truly embrace this trend of of the growing population and and people wanting to you know better lives and wanting to live more cost effectively? You know, is 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 music the answer to future-proof our cities? Well, I mean, it, it, it's part of the answer. And obviously, you know, I mean, you know, it's very important. When you, when you look at the success stories around the world, and as I say, there are more and more of them, you know, they all the... And most of these have been done with private money, by the way. Sometimes with... A, sometimes it's part private, part public. But it's crucial that you keep the basic facilities cheap for artists. You, know, you can't suddenly sort of start put, putting the rent out. Um, I mean, you can't stop gentrification, you know. Um, I mean, a lot of places desperately need it, you know. I mean, I, unfortunately, I think London, where I live close by, you live in it, you know, has probably gone too far in terms of, you know, it just, it just no one, you know, every, everything's just yeah. way, way, way too expensive and obviously it's suffering from clubs being closed down. I think you knew you would know the figures. I think isn't it fifty percent of closed live venues have closed down in the last thirty-five uh, uh, percent in in, uh, in six yeah. years. Yeah. Because of the problems with noise, you know, basically an area gets sort of gentrified, and then the new people go, yep. "Hey, can we can you stop this venue because it's annoying us?" You know. Yeah. Um, so as I say, I suspect London, and obviously New York's got this. You know, I mean, certainly the biggest thing. I'm sure a lot of Paris must be like this as, as well. So it, it's part of it, you know. So I mean, I think it's. Uh, I mean, 
London's so bad that, I mean, the, the, you would know something. You know, they're looking at places like Barking and Dagenham, which you won't have heard of, because there's absolutely no reason to go to Barking and Dagenham, apart from the fact that it's one of the few empty places left in London. It's where the big Ford factory is. You know, I mean, yeah. it's really... Well, then it, it's, no, yeah, it's just, I think, in my opinion, it's just gone too, too far. But I think it, there are op fantastic opportunities, and I'm saying you can... But it's, yeah, but it's all it's part it's part of the answer. It's part yeah, of the answer. Absolutely. You know? And it's recognising it. I'm sure know. Milan has some a couple of do, do you have any um, empty areas left? <laughs> Are there any empty factories I can buy? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course. I would ask just one thing. That I think the music is a crucial point of our city agenda now because it responds uh, in a very efficient way to a clear political mission of our, our mayor, Pepe Sala, that of making Milan as a younger and more international city. And music is, responds very well to this mission. But I, will add, I would add also another thing, that Milano is now in a very strange situation and completely new for us. The 19% of the people living in Milan comes from other countries and other cultures, of course. And you should consider that it's a completely new situation for Milan and for Italy. Of course, if we are thinking about London or even Paris, this is not a new situation. But Milan, I think 10 years ago, we have had about 6 or 7% of the population coming from other countries. Now, 10 years later, we have 19% of people coming from other, other countries and other cultures. And the music is really a, a, the, the most important driver of... Not, I would not use the, the word inclusion, but of dialogue between different cultures. In 2015, thanks to the World Expo we hosted in Milan, that was about food, we started a program called uh, Bread and Music. Because two things you can share with other people coming from other cultures, maybe with a problem in understanding your, your own language, and the two things are food and music. And so we create this program with beautiful evenings where communities from different parts of the world, coming from Africa, from Asia, from South America, met at their typical restaurant, sharing the different dishes and different foods coming from their culture, and of course, sharing also musical experience, music experience. And so people uh, playing and singing, all the folk and traditional repertoire of the culture. And it was a beautiful driver of dialogue, uh, mixing the idea of sharing food and music in the same evening from uh, people coming from different countries. And it was very important now, it's very important now, because you know almost 20% of our uh, citizens now are coming from very different countries and very different parts of the world. Absolutely. I think it's important to recognize that. I mean, you know, we're talking about music cities, but ultimately music is the, th the, the tie that binds and then everything else around it is the, the ingredients which add more flavor, more energy and, and attraction. And I think, you know, combining the themes is very interesting because who doesn't like food and who doesn't like music? It's, it's a win-win in so many ways. But it's all about binding it in with, a, with a, a more enriched infrastructure for the city through policy, through certain initiatives, through recognizing the deficiencies, through mapping out what you have, through bringing in celebrations on heritage, through communication. And it's, I think it's, it's important for the cities of the future. And I truly believe, personally, in a lot of the work that we're doing as a company is allowing cities to have music strategies and I believe that every city will have a music strategy within the next 10 years because those that don't will fall by the wayside and music has proven to kind of uh, you know a healthy music ecosystem within a city directly um, resonates as a as a um, uh, kind of indicator on how well a city is doing both economically and and socially so I think, um, I believe we have um, a video that Bruno wants to show. If anyone's got any questions, I would like you to prepare them, if that's okay. We don't have a lot of time. Are we okay for time? Okay. Um, so, yeah, I think if we play the video, ask some questions, and thank you for your time. 
short videos about promoting Paris. The night. Paris ne dort jamais. Des premières heures de la nuit aux lueurs de l'aube, plongé dans la magie des nuits parisiennes. Tous les soirs, Paris s'éveille pour vous emmener au cœur de ces nuits légendaires. Entre bar tendance ou cosy, salle de concert, théâtre, bar, club de jazz, nightclub et cabaret, Paris est plus que jamais la capitale de la fête. Tous les goûts, toutes les nationalités, toutes les classes sociales se mélangent dans des lieux originaux et hétéroclites. La réputation des nuits parisiennes n'est plus à faire. En 2014, Paris est resté la première destination touristique mondiale. Alors, la branchitude à Paris, c'est quoi Prendre l'apéro dans des PMU transformés en bars branchés Passer la soirée dans un bar à cocktail sophistiqué ou un bar club agité de bonnes électro Ou bien sortir la nuit dans un club confidentiel ou dans le plus glamour des cabarets spectacles parisiens Ou encore, voir un concert, un événement sportif, un spectacle dans une salle mythique So, I mean, that goes to show that um, when we talk about our music cities and, and creating spaces and safe, safety and, and, and how we kind of um, manage and interact within our cities, the night is very important. And I know a lot of cities, we're not going to get into the whole idea of night uh, mayors and night managers and night czars. Um, but I think what Paris have adopted very successfully is this idea of... Um, Uh, you know, the, the night isn't um, a kind of, um, at, isn't against the day, the day isn't against the night, it's all about managing all areas of the city and, and looking after the people that work at night and the people that go out and enjoy themselves at night. Um, so that is one recommendation I would always put into cities, but what does, do, are there any questions out there before we, we depart? We've informed you fully. So we all know what a music city is. Yes, sir. Do we have a microphone? No. no? Can you stand up and shout? Is that okay? Okay. Uh, just summarizing, uh, according to you, which are the essential main factors for a city to be a music city? I mean, like three essential factor that a city must have in order to call it a music city. Would anybody like to take that or shall I take that? Well, I think there's a difference between, obviously there's certain cities in the world that kind of are music cities. Obviously, you know, Nashville, Memphis, Austin. It's much more important because they're just like, just having a general strategy towards music. I think that, that's, that's, that's the most important thing. So, see, so if, as far as I'm concerned, everywhere should have some sort of... Stra as, as you just mentioned, Danny, I think that's more... You know, I mean, you know, there's only so many places that are going to be tourist destinations out and out for me, but it's like... It's, but everywhere above a certain size should have some sort of strategy. That's the important thing. And I, I think that, you know, regardless of the size, as Martin said, you know, you, you could be addressing a really small town, but at the end of the day if they are acknowledging the fact that music operates and you know, people um, interact better, learn better, kind of grow old, smarter and wiser and have more memories and more enriched lifestyles, you know, if, if, if cities recognize that at policy... And, and it can be villages as well. It absolutely can, yeah. I mean, Halden, there's, there's a really cool fest. This is a small town, village in Germany, it has a great festival. They also now run the main bar in the, in the, in the village square. They have some really cool artists because it's kind of between Amsterdam and Hamburg. And so they get some really great artists playing there. They've got a recording studio there now. They've got a little record store. And this is a, like maybe 5,000 people. Okay, they're lucky they've got a festival. But I mean, it doesn't yeah. have to be a big city. It can be like a sort of, you know, obviously that's become a regional hub. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we, we've, I think we've had cities fall victim to the idea that they can be a music city if they have just one thing, if they just have a festival or they just have an artist that comes from there. I think it's less about the, the kind of the business side of it, which comes. It's more about acknowledging the operation of music within the space and how it does bring us together in a social level and also how the city can support that growth because 
it's not about creating the next, um, you know, Daft Punk or creating the next U2 or whatever. It's about supporting creative communities to enrich the life of the city. And, you know, as, as we've repeatedly uh, said, these areas that regenerate quick are down to creatives taking over and, and, and kind of rooting themselves. So I think it's all about how we can support that in a managed way so that we're, we're evolving our cities in a, in a managed state. So we're not, gonna fit, we're not gonna face the crises that we have faced in the future. We're not gonna have deficit of talent or, or you know. And, and a big thing which I don't think we've touched upon is, well, I think we may have um, danced around it, but if you have good cultural and music operations within your city, that's where the brightest, smartest people want to live and work. So if you're thinking about businesses in the private sector, how do you attract the big companies of the world to come to your city? Well, you have cool cities to live in, and that's where their people want to work, that's where they will have the edge. Like, you know, Google or what have you, companies like that are going to want to be in the cities that they can really, you know, enrich their importance on it. So I think that's something to, to keep in mind as well. There's, there's two things I would, I'd, like to, I'd like to say. One thing is about, uh, I mean, Austin and Memphis and, and so on, the music cities in the world, but I don't know how long Austin has been a music city. Uh, they did South by Southwest and then at some point it was the live music capital of the world. Self-branded. <laughs> yes. Statistically, Melbourne is, right? This is something we've, we've learned. Melbourne is the live capital of the world statistically. All right. But right. Austin, so put the flag can, in the you ground. You can change it, and you can change it in, in, a, in a span of, I don't know, 20 years of becoming, I don't know, one of the 10 most famous music cities in the world. I think nowadays you need to have a strategy for this. It's not as easy as uh, 50 yeah. years ago. Uh, Another, another thing I wanted to say is from Hamburg, from looking at Hamburg, you might get, and other cities, you might get the idea that it's possible to just build a huge block of a philharmonic orchestra building um, there, and then you can say, okay, now Hamburg is a music city. But um, two years ago, everyone was looking at this, at this building and saying, oh, what a shame for Germany, and what a shame for Hamburg, and uh, the biggest fucking joke in, <laughs> since since, I don't know, 30 years in, in Hamburg, but um, the whole thing really is working very well right now and the whole world actually looked at Hamburg for, for the music, uh, for the Elbphilharmonic building and for the music that they do and that they bring into the city and the whole thing could not have worked without an infrastructure around. In a city as big as, as, as Hamburg, you need to have a diverse structure to make such a thing happen with success. And I think, uh, you know, a project like the Philharmonie, you know, wouldn't be as important if it didn't have the Reaper Barn, if it didn't have the music heritage from the classical through to the pop music, if it didn't have all of these pits and the people living there supporting and working within it and interacting with At it. At the same time, we need to make sure, and that's what we need to do right now as lobbying for music business, same for the artists' organization, the club association, that we're not... Um, that they're not just like the tourism board and the uh, and, and, and the cultural senate and the city itself. That they're not just looking at the El Philharmonic building and supporting that because of the 30 million euros that go into music uh, from the senate, 20 million go into the Philharmonic or uh, Philharmonic um, El Philharmonie, 5 million go into the symphony, symphonic orchestra, and I think another. 2.5 into the opera, and then what's left? So right now, all politicians say, obviously, clubs are very, very important, and they attract people, but they don't have money to add up uh, the other 25 million to add up to clubs, which are as important as the uh, opera and stuff. Well, I think that's, that's key, the, the evolution of mentality to, to recognize that the reappropriation of cultural spend is probably what we will have to see in the future to then support these these cities growing. I would say also that yep. <laughs> uh, I think it's very important for a music city to to have music as a crucial part of the educational projects you are doing. Absolutely. So you have to help a lot all the school of music but not only on the professional formation, but also from the 
from the, from the basic level of uh, musical education because if you have a, a city where the citizens especially the kids have a, a, an, a conscious approach to music or you can create the better condition to have a real music city absolutely and i refer to the term i used earlier which is pretty cheesy but music from nursery to nursing home is how we need to think about it Thank you all very, very much. I think we've covered quite a lot in a very short space of time. I would like to thank my very esteemed panelists. They're all going to hang around and, and charm you with their intelligence and expertise. So be quick. Um, and thank you all for listening and for being patient with us. Sorry I was late. Thank you.